deep, but then we're going to pop out of that pool, and you're going to feel refreshed, and you're going to be excited. And so you want to be here for that. And then we're going to top it off with gingerbread s'mores in the lobby. It's going to be a great day, so we'd love for you to be a part of that. I want to welcome everybody who's watching on the live stream and here in the gathering to part two of our series, Connected Christmas. Last week, if you missed it, make sure you watch it on our YouTube channel or in the church app. We talked about the beginning part about being connected takes time. You know, if we want to be connected this Christmas to God and to others, it takes time. And we talked about how Jesus, right, with point one, that first light on the cross, we talked about how Jesus pursued us through the incarnation. He came and dwelt among us, Emmanuel. And then point two, the second light, was how as Jesus pursued us through the incarnation, we're called to pursue others through initiation. And how that as Christ followers, we don't wait. We don't cross our arms and sit in the seat and wait for others to come to us. But we pursue others and take that initiation. And we talk about how it takes investing time over time. It doesn't happen in one day. It doesn't happen necessarily in one month. And sometimes it doesn't happen in one year. Sometimes it doesn't happen in one decade. Right? It takes time over time. Well, this morning for part two, we're going to talk about our talents. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Luke chapter 1. How many of you have ever looked at someone else, whether it's someone in your life that you know or someone you've seen on TV, and you had the thought, man, I wish... I was more like that person. I wish I could do what they do. I wish I could have the gifts that they have. And if that's you and you can relate to that and you're here in the gathering, say, uh-huh. Okay, awesome. I, I would say, I say, uh-huh, too. If you're online, go ahead and type in, uh-huh. I think I know how to spell it, but just give it a try. They know what you mean. Uh-huh. I think every single one of us has, at some point of our lives, struggled with the feelings of insecurity or the feelings of inadequacy. We look at somebody else and what they do and who they are, and we look at ourselves in comparison, and most of the time, the result is inadequacy and insecurities. And if I could be completely transparent with you this morning, this has been something that I have wrestled with uh, most of my entire life. You know, the, the reality is the things that you are naturally good at, the things that you are gifted at doing, because you have grown up with that, to you it is not a gift. To you it is common because you have just always d done that. And so oftentimes we're blind to the very things that God has gifted us with. And if you add to that, depending on what your skill set or your gifts are, not all gifts are praised the same. For instance, my my gift is I am very good at talking. I'm very good with people skills. But as a, as a child, that, that gift isn't always praised. For instance, talking in, in class isn't always look, is, is often frowned upon, especially when your teacher is talking. I remember so many times annoying my family to death because I would not stop talking. I would not give. My brother just said amen. Uh, I, I, I will sometimes would not even take a breath, and now I'm reaping what I've sown in my son. I remember, you know, this so much, growing up as a teenager, in, uh, one time this one girl ca came up to me and said, Jeremy, when I get married, I want to be married to someone just like you. And I thought, well, you can't get any better than me than me. What, like, what's wrong with me? Why don't you want to connect? Why don't you want to date me? Like, why is there someone else like me? It, it, and I remember I used to love as a kid opening up doors for, um, for people. I just love people. But the gifts and talents I had were not, you know, often praised. And then you know, the ones that were, you know, are athletes, musicians, and people who are really cra super crafty at things. And I played sports, you know. I loved sports. But when I was in high school, my number one sport was bowling. I mean, most people aren't really impressed with that. <laughs> and uh, there's not too many people clamoring to watch bowling events taking place. Uh, that's why you have the national championship, which makes tons of money for football, but not bowling. But after God captured my heart, 
uh, and began to move in me. I felt his calling on my life. I went into college, but even there I still wrestled with that because I began to meet other people who were phenomenal singers and musicians, and they were great orators and speakers, and they had electric personalities, and, and I didn't have you know, any, any of that, and I would wrestle with insecurities. And, and then I met my wife, Julie, and, and I loved spending time with her, and, and we would often, um, when we could, travel back to Des Moines, Iowa to see uh, her family. And I remember, you know, one of the trips talking with my father-in-law, who has recently passed away, and I remember sitting there on the couch telling him something like this, and, and I said, Larry, I do not have any talents or abilities. And I meant it. I felt it. That, that's what I believed. That's what was over my heart. And, and, I, and now that I'm older, I realize that insecurities and inadequacies are a part of our spiritual enemy, Satan's deception of, of destruction in our lives. Because think about it. If we believe in the lives of the enemy, we're not believing in God's truth. And if we're not believing in God's truth, we're not walking in his freedom. And if we're not walking in his freedom, then we're often walking in shackles. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I just asked, I wondered this question. I said, could it be that part of the reason we struggle with connection is because we're not walking in God's freedom? We're walking in insecurities. And even celebrities who have made it wrestle with this as well. I know she is older, and maybe some of you who are younger may not know who she is. Maybe you are, but Madonna um, had this um, interview, and this is what she said. She said, I have so many regrets, and I have none. I wish I hadn't have done a lot of things, but on the other hand, if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here. But then again, nobody works the way I work. I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer. Listen to this. It's the horrible feeling of inadequacy. I'm always struggling with that fear. She sa- goes on to say this. My drive in life, so what motivated her, what got her up in the morning, was from a horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. So here is this person who has, you know, made it in success in the eyes of our culture, and yet she is gripped with inadequacy and gripped with insecurities. And insecurity can be a significant roadblock to connection. Because when we're insecure, have you ever thought about this? When you and I are insecure, we are self-focused. Instead of thinking about others, we're worried about ourselves. When we're insecure, we're afraid to step out in what God's calling us to do because we hear his voice and then we go, wait, but God, I, but I can't because, you know, fill in the blank. When we're insecure, we bury our talents instead of saying yes to God with the one or the ten that he's given us. When we're insecure, we strive and we work. But instead of working out of motivation of love and joy, we work being motivated like Madonna out of fear of inadequacy. But on the flip side, when we know our worth, when we know our identity in Christ, when we walk in relationship with him and confidence and say yes We can say yes to him because we know whatever talents and passions he's given me, whether one or whether a hundred, they're all for his glory. So this morning, if money and accomplishments and people's approvals do not solve the insecurity problem, what does? And does God really use every single person who makes himself available? And could God use me even though I've messed up so many times? Here at Wyandotte Family Church, we have a slogan. It's like the main theme throughout the message. Last week, it was connection takes time. But this morning's slogan, why don't you repeat it with me nice and loud. If you can say, I'm created, equipped, and called by God for his purpose. That was pretty good. That was a good warm-up. All right, one more time. Say, I'm created, equipped, and called by God for his purpose. Awesome. And if you're online, go ahead and type that up in the chat as well. We're going to go to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 30. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth 
to a virgin betrothed or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And a virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. During the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Gabriel shows up to Nazareth to talk to a young, most likely teen, virgin girl named Mary. And I love what scholar Joel Green points out, is that we don't know much, as we read Luke, we don't know much about Mary's family. We know about Joseph, but not about Mary. So it's almost like that Mary, in, in the Luke's narrative, is like an orphan. That she just kind of shows up. And the only thing that we know about her is that she's engaged to be married to Joseph. Now, one of the things about this, this ancient culture in the Middle East was that the females didn't really have any significance. And, they, and so it was the male who had the respect. It was the male who had the authority. It was a male, and it was kind of, it's unfortunate. And Jesus, you know, kind of re- began to reverse that when he came. But that's how it was. And so the fact that she wasn't even married yet means that Mary was low in culture. She was low in status. She did not have much worth compared to what people thought in that day and age. Yet Luke shows that how God uses Elizabeth, a woman who was barren, and if you were barren in that day and age, it was um, like, you know, a big X that was marked on you, and you were looked down upon. And so it was just, here's Luke showing us that God's using Elizabeth, and now he shows up to an unknown, low-status teen girl. And then when the angel shows up, he calls her, I love this. The favored one. Once again, another reminder that what God sees in us is different than what others see. She may not have been held in high status in her culture. However, you know what? When God looked at her, he said, you are highly favored. And I want to pause here for a moment. Because maybe others at some point in your life have spoken words of destruction into your life. Maybe they've spoken words to you that have caused a spiral of consumption of insecurity and inadequacies. And maybe you have felt like you don't fit in anywhere. You have nothing to offer. Well, I want you to know this morning that God sees something completely different when he looks at you. He sees you as his child, and you are highly favored. And he has given you passions and proficiencies that he is calling you to use for his kingdom. And it goes on in verse 28. It says, Mary was troubled when she heard this. And she was trying to figure out what this greeting meant. And Gabriel's response to her was, do not be afraid. And it's understandable that Mary was troubled. I mean, if you were going about your day, and you, know, you were going to Meijer, and you're shopping, and that one moment you're in the frozen pizza aisle, and bam, there's Gabriel, the angel, going, you, you know, you're highly favored. It would startle you, and it would be confusing. And I wonder, this is pure speculation, but if, if Mary was startled, not only because there's an angel standing right in front of her, but because the greeting was started off with, you are highly favored. I mean, I mean Mary could have been thinking, who am I? I'm this lowly teenager. I, 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 why, why am I highly favored from the Lord? I have nothing to offer God. But everyone say, I'm created, equipped, and called. By God for his purpose. Let's read the next couple verses. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he'll be great. And he'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? This is the third time in eight verses Luke mentions that Mary was a virgin. And this is important because when there is a repetition in Scripture, it is, it is never by accident. It is there by design. And so 
God is communicating a point here in this passage of Scripture. It sh- that it should be absolutely impossible for Mary to conceive because she is a virgin. Mary's response in verse 34 is understandable and natural. It's more of an inquisitive response, not a doubtful, like, how could this happen? I, you know, but more like, this is, this is curious. I, I hear what you're saying, but uh, did, you, did God know I'm a virgin? I remember when Julie and I called us to plant a church here in Wyandotte in 2009, and, and there were so many things that were tough along the journey. And I remember going, God, how can this be? Like, I hear what you're saying, but God, but how can this be? And maybe you felt that way before too. Maybe you sense God stirring your heart and opening up an opportunity for you or, or beginning to put a passion in your heart for something. And you're going, but God, I don't fill in the blank. Or maybe you've messed up in the past, and you're going, God, but I've, I've done too much. Or maybe you come from a broken family. Or maybe you don't have the right resources, or the right status, or the right support system. Well, I want to show you a verse that's pretty powerful, because if that's you, you and I are in good company. Look at 1 Peter 2.4. It's talking about Jesus. It says this, 1 Peter 2.4. It says, as you come to him, Jesus, a living um, stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, this is, he was chosen and precious. Isn't that awesome? Jesus was rejected by many. You know, he didn't have the, the resources. He didn't have the crowd. He didn't, he didn't have all these things. And yet, the Lord looked at him because he was chosen and he was precious. And in the same way, you are equipped, created, and called by God for his purpose. Verse 35 continues, and an angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son, and in this, is in the sixth month with, uh, with her who was called barren. I love that, who was called. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Scholar Joel Green points this out as well. He says the point of this passage and this whole dialogue isn't Elizabeth and it isn't Mary, even though God loves them immensely. Even though God elevates their status and shows that God is, wants to use every single one of us, regardless of where we come from and regardless of who we are, but his whole point in this passage is this, is that God has been working his plan and his purpose to redeem Israel and ultimately humanity and has come to this culmination moment where Jesus is coming into our world. God was fulfilling his promises from generations in the past and was coming to this moment and he was inviting humanity to be a part of that plan. It was going to be the Holy Spirit that was going to make this happen. This is so powerful. I love this when, it, when I was doing the study. Is that when he says to Mary, the Holy Spirit is going to o- come upon you and overshadow you, is the same in the Greek as when Acts 1.8, when Jesus tells his disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you and is going to empower you to be my witness. So the same Spirit of God that came upon Mary to do the impossible and bring forth Jesus is the same Spirit that's going to come upon you to do what he has called you to do. So it doesn't matter what limitations we have. It doesn't matter what past we have. It doesn't matter what, what resources or education we have. It doesn't matter what fill in the blank what we don't have. If God calls us to it, his Holy Spirit will empower us to do it. It's kind of like this, this pizza box here. Um, I, I asked someone to help give me a pizza box. And, and uh, can we give um, Dimitri a round of applause for helping me out here? Thank you for bringing it up here. All right, you can be seated. All right. So I have a pizza box here. Now, how many of you had pizza this past weekend? Raise your hand. That's fa- if you had pizza this past weekend. Okay, see some hands going up. Some, you said it. You're like, uh, I did. Okay. Uh, well, pizza is awesome because, man, when you open it up, Ooh, it still smells like pizza. It's good. Um, let's say it's a Saturday and you ordered some pizza. And all of a sudden, you hear the doorbell ring, right? You're getting wa- ready to watch University of Michigan in the playoffs. Uh, so, yep, yep, you're getting ready to watch that game. And 
And you get up, you run to the door, and the, you open the door, and the pizza delivery boy, or, or uh, specialist, sorry, is, 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 is holding the pizza in his hand without the box. And the grease is running down their elbow, and you see it dripping. What would you say to, that, to the delivery specialist? <laughs> you, would, you would say, right, where in the world is the box? <laughs> like, I'm not going to eat that. Where is the box? And it's interesting because this box isn't very valuable. I mean, you can make, uh, uh, they can get these boxes probably around 30 cents a box. And most of us know cardboard. There's not big scrap yards for ca cardboard, okay? There's for metal and different things like that, but uh, cardboard gets recycled. It's not worth it very much. But even though it's not worth very much, it's, it's extremely valuable. And the reason why the pizza box is valuable, it's because of what's inside, what it carries. And in the same way, you and I are the pizza box. Left to ourselves, we can feel insecure. If it's only up to us, there's not much we can do. But we're not valuable because we have all these skills and all these talents. We're valuable because of what is on the inside. We are made in the image of God, and if you are a Christ follower, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you that you carry with you everywhere you go. And because of that, we're valuable. I'm going to smell pizza now the rest of my sermon. And so this should be so freeing because when we live our lives for ourselves and we focus on ourselves, we'll be crippled with insecurities. We'll look at what we can and cannot do, what we have and what we do not have. However, when we put our eyes upon Jesus and we understand that he created us for his purposes and that our lives are all about him, then life becomes so freeing. Because whether we have one small talent to offer him, we understand that one small talent isn't about us anyways. It's about us being invited to this grand story of God redeeming people to himself. And if you happen to have a hundred talents and you could do all this over here, it's not about you either. It's about using those hundred talents to partner with God as he invites us into the, the grand play of redemption, of bringing people back to right relationship with him. And Gabriel says in verse 37, he ends it by saying, nothing will be impossible for God. He reminds, this is so good, he reminds Mary that God's plans and his purposes do not um, depend upon people's power. And God's plans and his purposes are not hindered by our people's limitations. His plans and his purposes will go forth. They will prevent. The question is going to be, am I going to be a part of it? Am I going to say yes to whatever role he has called me to? Because I'm created, equipped, and called by God for his purpose. Lastly, the last verse we're going to look at this morning, verse 38, this passage ends. It says, and Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. See, even though Mary didn't have all the answers, she said yes to God. Even though she would not have been drafted first by her culture, she said yes to God. Even though this wasn't a part of her own plans, I'm sure this was not on her five-year growth plan, but she said yes to God. And those who make this shift in their life, if you make this shift where you realize, my life is not about me. I was placed on this earth, not for me. I was placed on this earth for God. If you can make that shift, then you will say yes whenever God calls your number to the plate doesn't matter what it may be or how difficult it may seem, you will say yes, even when it doesn't make sense. Because you say, it's not about me. It's about God. God will always do what he promises he will do. And nothing is impossible for him. So he has created us for far more than this temporary world. He's created us for far more than just comfort. 
He's created us far more for just re- than just retirement. He's created us for far more than, than just to get by. He's cre- called us and he's created us and equipped us f- for his purposes. So imagine the joys, even in the midst of the challenges, of experiencing the movement of God in and through you as you say yes to him. Imagine the stories that you will get to share about God's faithfulness if you say yes to him. Think about it. You and I are here today because Mary said yes to God. So Mary's life has impacted us all these years later, all because she said yes to God. And that same Holy Spirit is in you. If you say yes to God when he calls your number, then others in generations to come will be the benefit as well because you will have partnered in the plan of God and you've been a part of his fulfilling his purposes on earth. I am created, equipped, and called by God for his purpose. Check out this closing video. You know, and we, we know the, 
the story. We've seen the movies. We've read the text. And we think, I could never be used like that by God. But the reality is that Mary, Elizabeth, you know, Joseph, they were just like you and me. They, they were broken. They didn't have all the resources, but they had one thing in common. They said yes to God. And he speaks to every single one of us and calls us to be a part of his plan and his purposes in loving and serving and seeing the purposes of God prevail. So what would happen for all of us if we would said, yes, God, I want to be used by you? You know, some of these things would happen. Alan Madeira, last month in November, felt like God nudged him to help coordinate as best as he could to help get um, food and items to needy families for Thanksgiving. And it was so cool because he didn't have the resources, but as he said yes to God, um, if you go to hit the next slide, you'll see that uh, they ended up giving out a whole, um, each of those boxes represented a different family that got turkey, that got um, uh, stuffing and other things, and uh, we're a part of that because Alan said yes. And he's not here this morning, but uh, going to hit the next slide is, is he's also felt that... Um, him and Paul Soborowski together are working on doing the same thing this Christmas. And um, you'll see on the screen, if you want to take a picture of that or write that down, is on the 15th, they're going to uh, meet to go shopping. And this is so cool, is, is uh, the school district every year shares with local churches a, a list of families that are in need um, that are, could use some food, some clothing around the Christmas uh, season. And there's 15 families, and we, we said, hey, we want to help them all. And listen, we said yes. And so our benevolence team started having conversations. And without even hunting it down, we had a, a thriving organization um, donate $250 a gift card. And without even hunting it down, we received $800 from Meyer um, towards this project. And so we have over $1,000 to go shopping for these families. And we have also our own benevolence resources. So we can now provide food. Um, some maybe coats or shoes and uh, toys. And so if you want to be a part of that, um, you could go ahead and write that down. And there is Alan's number as well. And Paul Sebrowski, who's on our benevolence team, is working with Alan. And uh, all that happened just because of a simple yes. Just saying yes. I think about um, our, our facility team. And this is so funny because I have, I was giving this to Alan Madeira um, let him know I was proud of him and, and be a reminder to keep saying yes to God. He's not here. And then Dan Madigan, who's our facility um, uh, leader, um, is not here this morning. He's always here. And so I'm going to ask Ron St. Charles, if you can uh, give Ron St. Charles a round of applause. If you come up here real quick, representing, he's our co-leader. He uh, represents our facility team, but we have Ronald St. Charles, Dan Madigan, Al Mast, Larry Shillette, Ron Dabowski, uh, Joe Gorky, and others, um, you know, John Oates, who have helped on the facility team. And uh, you're going to see up here is we are getting super close to finishing our, our new children's classrooms. It has been, uh, we're going to have a party of all parties when these classrooms open up. Um, and uh, they are uh, getting super close. We just had um, Guy and Missler here this past week um, putting in the heating and, and, cool, uh, and cooling uh, registers and duct work in so we can get the registers in and get that set. And then we can finish uh, the drop ceiling. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, that's the hallway. And then that door that is going to become opened up into the treehouse room. So that will become a hallway entered from the treehouse room. So, and those glass that you see there are so you can look in on your kids, but your kids can't see you. Isn't that beautiful? And so for the people who have little ones, they won't, you know, when they see mama, ah, right? They start losing it. And so um, listen to this. This is so cool. And I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. There are going to be children that grow up to know about the love of Jesus Christ because you said yes. Amen. That's right. You and your team said yes. I know there's a lot of Tuesdays where you're like, man, it's been a rough day at work. It would be easier to go home. 
But you said yes. And there's going to be children that learn about Jesus Christ because of you and your team. And uh, we have this ornament that you can hang on your tree. And it's just a Savior is born. And, and our prayer is that um, this is just a reminder to continue to say yes to, to him whenever he calls your name. So we love you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about, and now Michelle is actually in the back right now working with our children, but I think about Operation Christmas Child, is there are 142 children that are going to receive a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, um, obviously, all of you participated, but Michelle was the one to tell Jonathan, yes, I'll help coordinate it. I'll step up. Uh, I, I am passionate about this. This is a passion the Lord has given me, and I'm saying yes, we have an ornament for her. And I think about even a few, couple of few weeks ago, um, we had a bunch of people come um, help pack for conne uh, the connected Christmas boxes and decorate the, the church facility. And because all these people use their ability to serve, families are going to spend more time with Jesus and with each other this Christmas season. And there's going to be some that might even do this and go, hey, why don't we continue to do something like this the all year round? Why don't we memorize verses and why don't we do crafts and spend time together and seek Jesus together? And this happens because some of you said, yes, yes, I'll do it. Yeah, I know it's not convenient, but yes. And so Helen and Sue and Chris and Rose and Kathleen and Charmaine and Selena and Rebecca and Benjamin and Teresa um, and, and uh, Kristen and others said yes. And we have an ornament for you as well, so make sure you, you see me um, afterwards. And I, I just wanted to share this with you is because whenever you and I say yes to God, God fulfills his purposes through us. And we saw on there, we laughed, but we saw on there that it's not easy. It never was easy. Mary and Joseph had to walk through a lot of hardship. They had to endure shame from their community because, yeah, you saw that. Yeah, that's convenient. Um, yeah, an angel told you that she was miraculously conceived. That, like, that's ever happened before. Right? It hadn't. Then they had to travel pregnant through the, through the census, and they didn't have, you know, cars to travel in. And then they had to get there, and there was no room in the end. Come on, God, can you throw me a bone? All right, we had to be, the Savior was born in a, in a, in a stable, stinky animals. Right, it wasn't easy. And then they had to flee to Egypt because Herod was killing all the, 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 the children. I mean, hardship, challenge after hard. So I, I just want you to hear from your pastor. Never will it be a cakewalk to say yes to God. Never. Um, but here's the cool thing. He empowers you through the Holy Spirit. And when you say yes, I'm going to partner with you, God, on your plan and your purpose, then you get to experience the supernatural in the middle of it, and there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And so the slogan for today is I am created, equipped, and called by God for his purpose. Every single one of us regardless of where we come from. You can bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up the gathering today. And if you have never crossed the line into a relationship with Jesus, this would be the best season to do it. We celebrate Christmas because a baby was born, not just a baby, but the Son of God, born so he could live his life and die on the cross. But not just any cross, I mean, not just to die on the cross, but he died so he could rise again. And he did. He rose again on that third day. And if you read the book of Acts, which we're going to this next year, you'll see time and time again, it talks about his resurrection, his resurrection, his resurrection. Because, because of the resurrection, that sets him apart from everybody else. He is Lord. He died and he rose again. And he's coming again for his children. And if you would like to be a part of the family of Jesus, will you pray with me? Just simply agree with me in your heart and just say, God, I want to be yours. I give you my life and my lifetime. I trust that you are who you say you are, that you are God, that you died and you rose again, and that you are coming again. And I want to be a part of your family. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer and you're watching online, just uh, click I, uh, um, 
the button, raise hand, or send us an email at iprayed.wine.family.org. And in the gathering, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, uh, mark it on your communication card, take it to the Connection Center. We have a free uh, Bible for you. We would love to chat with you. And here's a challenge for every single one of us is here in about 10 minutes, every single person who has the church app is going to get a notification with a link. It's also going to be in the weekly email that gets sent out every week from, from um, Jonathan. As well, it's going to be posted on our Facebook page. And so we're, we're going to blast it out. It's going to be a link to um, called the Shape Assessment. And what it's supposed to help us to do is discover what our three P's are. Our, our pain, what, what, are we, what breaks our heart, our passions, what are we passionate about, and our proficiencies, what are, what are our talents, what are our skills. And help us to, uh, to discover that. And so I want to encourage everybody this week in the next seven days to take that assessment. And um, it's about a half an hour long. You say, well, half an hour? Like, what in the world? Like, well, he here's the deal. Is you could take a five-minute assessment and you get a five-minute result. Anything of life, of value, it, it takes work. And if you want to help uncover, and it takes time to think about it, to meditate about it, pray about it, and do it. And so it's going to take about a half an hour, but it's worth it. And, and then uh, what's going to happen is, is we're, we're going to follow up with you to just help guide you and direct you to use your pain, your passion, your proficiencies, and whatever God's calling you to do, whether it's outside of Wind Up Family, like Alan just on his own saying, hey, here's what God's called me to do, or whether it's uh, here within the church body, but God wants us to be a part of his plan. And he often has already given you what it is that he wants to use. And so um, I want to encourage you to do that. And then my last little uh, note is um, this assessment is a part of our First Steps course, which is we've now revamped and it's 100% online. And so you can take First Steps online at your own pace. And I want to thank Jamie Ragsdale, who has put this together. And I want to thank uh, the Wolfenbargers for videotaping uh, this. Um, they make it a lot more fun with a bunch of cool things, zip zazz and doodads and a bunch of other stuff. And so um, if you have never taken first steps before, before you take the assessment, go online and go through first steps. All you do is you go to I'm New and you'll go to first steps, sign up. And uh, there's just four videos. And listen, the longest video is 17 minutes, I think. I think, don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure the longest video is 17 minutes. So it's not like we're asking you to watch four, four movies, okay? Um, just 17 minutes or less. And, um, and just take this journey together. And let's, let's, let's step out of insecurity. Let's kick insecurity in the rear. And let's begin to step into the destiny that God has placed on our lives. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you, and then um, you will be dismissed. God, I thank you for every single person in this room, every single person who's watching online. Thank you that you have called them, you have created them, you have equipped them to be used by God for your purposes. Lord, for some, that's an earth-shattering realization. This life is not about me. I wasn't placed here to make myself great. I wasn't placed here to make myself look good. I wasn't placed here to build a good reputation and status. I was placed here to bring you glory. God, that's my number one purpose, is to worship you, to know you, to live for you. And God, I pray that the gifts and talents that we have, Lord, the passions that we have, God, that we will be consumed with a desire to use them for your kingdom and for your glory. God, that you would begin to shift and bring freedom in our hearts from inadequacy and insecurity. And God, that we won't worry about comparing ourselves to anybody else, but we would fix our eyes upon you. And that whatever you call us to do, God, we will say yes. Because when we say yes, there are going to be people added to your kingdom. When we say yes to you, people are going to be healed. When we say yes to you, people are going to be uh, encountering your love and your forgiveness, God. And so, Lord, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, or no matter how little we have, God, we're going to say yes to you. Because your Holy Spirit is inside of us, and your Holy Spirit is going to lead us and empower us. And so, God, I pray, and I pray your blessing on every single person. That they would go, God, today empowered as they take the assessment, help them learn new things. And I pray, God, as those who go for, through first steps, through the first time, may they learn new things. And I pray that this will be the best connected Christmas we've ever had. Well, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Have a great day.